Hi, good evening. <coughs> um, this will be number six. We're now going through well, it's almost Tisha Bowl. It's Thursday night before Tisha Bowl. You'll probably see this by tomorrow, I hope. Um, I am, of course, continuing in the three-week summer series, <coughs> which is entitled Fundamental Disagreement, the Maimonidean Controversies in the Middle Ages. Tonight's lecture, <coughs> excuse me, number six, which is entitled did Avram and Sar really exist? The fight over philosophical homiletics. As you can see, tonight's um, talk is being sponsored anonymously in honor of Ephraim Rosenblum and family and loving memory of Gavi el -Vashon. As I mentioned before, Gavi Rosenblum and I used to work in this room <laughs> where we're recording this. Mamish in this room. I'm plunging the body of my remarks. By saying, by starting by saying, I don't want to be corny, but last time Judaism got badly burned in the Maimonidean controversies of the 1230s, both literally as well as figuratively. <clears throat> literally, the books were burnt. As we saw, they're burned by the going by the Catholic Church at the behest of from Jews. Make sense? Figuratively, <clears throat> you had the breakdown of dialogue, the disappearance of civility, the shattering of consensus, and the debasing of Kabbalah Torah. That's called burnt. If you were on the <clears throat> Maimonidean side, you lost respect for the Balitosis, and who had indeed acted thoughtlessly. Indeed, the precise charge of thoughtlessness was articulated, as we saw last week, by the Ramban, who was himself a respecter of Balitosis, and who agreed with many of their specific criticisms of individual, point, individual points in the Ramos raids, but who thought that Tosa had been thoughtless in their ban. The strident criticism, Ramban strident criticism of the stance of the Tosafists, couched in respectful language to be short, indicated that he felt that these rabbis in northern France, and I'm talking about France, at the end of the Balitosis period, in the 1230s, he felt that Tosis had badly blundered and that as a result, respect for them had plummeted. Okay? They shouldn't, we talked about slave time, right? <laughs> Assuming they should have been, it wasn't in their territory, and you can't ask everybody to just read a book and, and, you know, and declare the Rambam trafe and all that sort of thing. Most significantly, <clears throat> a social, religious, Mm, reality had emerged by the middle of the 1200s. There simply were many people who were not going to follow the right wing and ban the Rambam in any way. Neither the Rambam <coughs> nor the Murna Vukham. They ain't going to hear of it. Indeed, one of the main points of the Ramban had been that any discountenancing of Maimonides was inadmissible because the Rambam had been among the greatest of the Gedolim Mutzadikim. So the entire Tosafistic thing, that there was something wrong with Maimonides, was quite out of the question in Spain and Languedoc, and in such places, where modern orthodoxy was a reality. <clears throat> the question was rather, how would the modern orthodox, the so-called Maimonideans, which is a term that simply means you are a fan of the Rambam to one degree or another. How far would they go to the left? Would it just be Torah Mata, like the Chachmi Lunya? Fine. They're great people. Right? No problem. It was impossible to stigmatize such types as Michutz Lamacha. That was like the mistake of Tosis. Right? However, there was an entire other group. I'm using, obviously, modern terminology this other group would not be Torah Mata, they'd be open Orthodox, who indeed claimed the legitimacy of Orthodox Judaism in the, 12th, in the 13th century. They declared the Rambam to be their Rebbe and their guide and the justifier of their entire Mahalach. And these people clearly pushed the envelope well past anything that Maimonides would have approved of. And like the Rambam, they assumed an attitude of smug superiority, as if those to their right 
were primitives and a D Neanderthals. Now, they didn't have any basis. They weren't chashub, they're just parody. But once you feel, as the Rambam did, but the Rambam maybe had justification, maybe. You know, it's the real meaning of the Torah, the real meaning of the, of the stories, the real meaning of Allah. So maybe you can look down on somebody else who has a different opinion and say, Nebuch. But these guys just assumed that position without having the gravitas of Maimonides. The ranks of these leftists did not incru- include great Talmudists, Lamdonim, Poskin, or anything like that. But then again, if you're on the left, why bother? Just look it up. You don't have to waste your time learning a lot of Gemara. Tosus, Mephorshim. Just look it up in the Mishnah Torah. And anyway, many of the laws, when uh, expounded philosophically, were expendable. Here we come across the great conundrum, my friends, of rationalism, which is still with us today. Now, basically, there's rationality, there's rationalism. Rationalism, rationality simply means you don't cross the street when the cars are running. You know, you don't, don't jump off a cliff. You act rationally. Rationalism means you feel that reason can comprehend the totality of reality and can explain everything. Um, in the case of Judaism, when it comes to the Tariq Mrs., if you are a rationalist of a type, do you convince yourself that you know the reason for a mitzvah, you kill the mitzvah? Because <clears throat> you don't have to give it. Mitzvah merely means to end. <clears throat> it's nothing new. I can show you Chazal, which I'll show you in a second of Medrash, about Shlomo HaMelch, in which he's charged with the crime of rationalism, which explains why Shlomo HaMelch was such a smart guy and talked to God, violated all those laws that apply to kings. Take a look at this. The first Medrash, first Medrash Rabbah in Boera. By Dabriel Kim El Moshe Bayer Malaman Yashem Boera La Ramil Yitzhiako, first passing of Era. Notice the words by Daber El Kim El Moshe, Daber and El Kim is is strong. By Yom Rei Lov, Ni Yashem, that's the Lashon Rakov. How did you see what Panisi and Ni Liros Chachma Bahos with Sichlus? Kimehorim Shiel Chachra Melcha Esa Shekro Aso. A Pasig from Kohelis. A Pasig is a name of Shlomo El Moshe. You could apply this verse. Which we'll build in a second, to both King Solomon and Moshe. We're going to confine our remarks right now to King Solomon. Kesad, how? When God gave the Torah, Nosan Mitzvah says either X number of positive commandments and of negative commandments. The Nosan and Melch mix this mitzvah, and there are a few commandments, not many, that apply specifically to a king. I think you're familiar with this. King can't have too much gold and silver, can't have too many wives, um, too many horses, things like that. So his heart will not go astray. But Shlomo got up and he was so smart, he thought he could outsmart the laws of God, the prohibitions of God. Meaning, because he wasn't, by the way, he was so smart. And Shlomo said as follows, why does it say, and we all know, King can't have too many wives? King Solomon family had a thousand. Where I come from, that's too many. Now, Shlomo reasoned as follows. Why does the Torah say, why did God say a king couldn't have too many wives? Doesn't it say, if he has too many wives, it will lead his heart astray? Ah, so you know the reason for the mitzvah. You hear what I just said? The reason for mitzvah. So once I know that the real problem is not having too many wives, but the real problem is they shouldn't lead my heart astray, I can have as many wives as I want. I'll just simply make sure that my heart does not go astray. It's called rationalism. The, this is a figurative story. The Yud in the word Yarba, the Yarba, the Yarba, the Prostrated itself before the heavenly throne. Oh Lord, didn't you say every single letter of the Torah, including a yud, will never be canceled? It's eternal. Hari Shlomo min Today Shlomo's canceling my mitzvah lo yaber lo nashim. He's taking all these wives. 
Hachit is part of Kol So that's a process. First, you find a reason for this mitzvah and get rid of that. Then you find another reason for another mitzvah and get rid of that. Next thing you don't have any mitzvahs anymore. Amla Kadosh Baruch in the story, God says to the letter Yud, Shlom Abel Kiyotzev Yud Betelem, but Kutzim Imcho Eni Mavatom. Ten thousand, a thousand of Solomons will die before I get rid of one letter in the Torah. And you can skip the next letter. Keep the next uh, slide. Now, the point is like this. It happened. He didn't marry too many wives, and they did leave Zara Strait. So the Torah tells you, you do this, it'll lead to that. It's like one plus one will equal two. Ushlomo Shir Lubatalosman at Torah. And about Shlomo Melch, who thought that he could cancel one of the laws in the Torah because he knew the reason for it. And after all, once you know the reason, enough to do the mitzvah. Maxibo, what does it say about him? Diri Agarman Yoka, Sigur Torah He was a guy who absorbed a lot of Torah and then barfed it out. Numa Gever Litiel, Torah says Shama Kashalei Abel Nashim. So Etiel Buchag, me and God are on the same level. Knows I can understand the reason for the mitzvahs. And what's it say? He lays it not shalom, but not shalom because of all. That when he got older, his wives led him astray, and they built churches. And you follow it literally. Shalom and Melch became an idol worshiper. If you follow it figuratively, he let them be. Amr Shem Ben Yochai, Nochlo Shalom Moshe Garf Bibin, Shalom Nichtav Love Hamikrazeb. King Solomon would rather have been a ditch digger all of his life, and not have this black mark on his record. That his old age, he became a religious one up to there. Okay. And it goes on and on about this. Okay? Now the idea is, you can look it up yourself if you're interested in the beginning of Pa'era. This is an, an ancient uh, uh, text which is stigmatizing rationalism. And it's doing so in the following context. If you convince yourself you know the reason for a mitzvah, then the, re- then the mitzvah is merely a means to an end. Once I know the reason for the end, I don't have to do the mitzvah. For example, Shabbos is only about remembering that God created the world and rest on the seventh day, which is what it says, I'll just put up a sign. Don't forget that God created the world. Put up a billboard. I don't have to worry about the 30 my malachas and all this other stuff. And so on and so forth. So, long before Maimonides raised these issues, or to be more exact than Maimonides, because Maimonides never violated any law. These guys were always smug rationalists, like Shlomo Melch, but without his wisdom. <laughs> okay? And this led to a neglect of mitzvahs. I might almost, almost, almost speak about a principle of antinomianism, not quite, in which they felt it's not necessary to do the laws. It's the first time this popped up in, in Jewish history, at least in the Middle Ages. Second of all, from our perspective today, uh, rationalism is inherently flawed as a tool of analysis for the Torah, if you believe the Torah was given by God. And the reason because Rationalism is always time-bound. You're going by, I'll use modern terminology, you're going by the best thought of the 21st century, by the best science of the 21st century. But we all know these things are very likely to be quite different in the 22nd century and the 23rd century, if the world survives that long. And that those things were granted what's rational in one generation isn't in another. Just think of the sea change in our own lives or what's considered normal and not normal in terms of homosexuality, for example, okay, and what was considered a rational appraisal of this phenomenon, society just simply switched on it. So, as soon as you tell me, I can explain the reason something happened in the Torah, or the reason for a mitzvah or something, which will make very good sense in the 21st century, the audience will like it in 2021, you realize, of course, in 10, 20, 30, or 100 years, they won't like it. And then what happened to your whole mitzvah? This is a problem we have, you and I, when we read the classical commentaries of yesteryear. Even Sam Sarifel Hershel wasn't that long ago. It's a very good word in the 19th century. It doesn't ring with us the same way today. That's my point. So rationalism, although it paraded itself as being the ultimate a tool of analysis, uh, was the opposite. It's always going to be radically flawed because it's always chronologically and time-bound. Let me put it this way. The Rambam explains much of the mitzvahs and Torah in his various writings in terms of the best science of his day. So is that true? The Torah is to be comprehended by the results of the 13th century science? 
the Rambam, for example, who's a great man, especially in Mordebuchim, is very interested in what Aristotle has to say. Is anyone interested in what Aristotle has to say today? Simply because the science has moved past him. All the scientific theories, or I'm sure most of them, are wrong for a variety of reasons. Aristotle may be great in the history of science because he started the ball rolling in terms of inquiry, but he was very far away from getting things right. And so you're going to tell me some myths, like the Ramos said, based on cosmology or something like that. The science is wrong, you see? And the Rambab was a child of his age. In the Middle Ages, Aristotle was still hot. He'd been hot for a thousand years. And some people thought he will be hot for another thousand years. It never occurred to them that in a couple hundred years, the whole Aristotelian uh, you know, framework would be broken. So these are just interesting things to keep in mind. Indeed, it is the intrinsic inutility of rationalism to get at the truth of religion, the truth of the Torah, if you're a believer, right? It is, it is futility but to be able to get at the truth that has always led to the attraction of mysticism, which asserts a reality beyond the rational, beyond the ability of science to comprehend. Those who are attracted by mysticism, and many are, and many have been, like precisely that fact. That it doesn't make sense rationally. Good, because the rational is time-bound and all that stuff. We're not interested in this. The Torah sublime... If God gave it, therefore it has to be something more than simply what some guy found in the science book. That, that kind of notion. Mysticism is fideistic. Uh, fideism, of course, would be the, the assertion that faith is a better way of getting at truth than science and reason. Uh, these are no-nos in the scientific world, in the university world, but they're yes-yeses among vast parts of the public. As we shall see, the more the rationalists pushed for a ruthless logic to deconstruct the Torah and the mitzvahs, the stronger rose the interest in the mystical interpretation of the Torah and the mystical performance of the mitzvahs. Right? We shall see. Maybe not today, next time. Uh, the Zohar emerges in, in the context of this, which totally lends an entire new universe of valorization to Italian mitzvahs and everything else. And it emerges right in the middle of the Maimonian controversy and in northern Spain. But anyway, on with our story. As we said, the whole set of clashes in the 1230s, which is what we talked about last time, merely resulted in each side doubling down. Inevitably, in such an environment, the extremes would flourish at the expense of the vital center. When you have continual... Uh, simmering, unsettled, ideological uh, battling and hatred, especially in a Cold War kind of way, both sides get more extreme. That's why American culture politically is what it is today. So on the right, you had people emerging like Ramosha Taku, the real form. Look at this off the internet. Ramosha Taku, Hebrew, Pinterest, you know, there's a it was probably 1250 to 1290. Yeah, so, Mamash at this time, in, in Ashkenaz. And we're going to say for farm, Talmud Chacham, look at the second paragraph. The Sifro, in his writings, Ton Ramosha Taku, Ki'ime Yosa Bari Logashmi, granted that God is not physical, Le'itimu Mitzamtim Mitzatim Ophiyo Bitsur Gashmi, but he can make himself physical and assume a, a material form. Hey, I thought that's Christianity. Right? <laughs> Is a super from God. By Yecholos Lasso, say Yasem and Mikohain Sovis. And his ability to do so is part of his infinite power. It's the old line. Can God make something weird that's stronger than himself? You understand? So you find the right wing as extremes going off the deep end and embracing, what shall I say, corporealism. That God has a body. Um, and he was the frummy. On the left, we have what we call allegories go wild, as you shall see. The question here was one's approach to the stories of the Torah, starting, I guess, with Adam and Eve. There are several aspects to this issue. First of all, there certainly is in Judaism a tradition, let's go to the next one, of parties. That the Torah can be comprehended at different levels. Shot remis, drash, sod. Shot is a plain meaning. Remember some kind of a hint. Jirash, 
I don't know how you translate, and so would be like mysticism. And that simply means that there are different levels of understanding the Torah. Now, they're multivalent. Both can be true, all four true. In fact, I'm sure you've heard the expression, there are 70 faces to the Torah, Shem the Torah. So if I say the story of Akedis Yitzhak is a moral tale that talks to me about how parenting should take place, that's okay. But you do agree that Pshad, <laughs> you do agree that it was a guy named Avram, he had a son named Yitzhak, and he tried to shock him. Right? You agree with the facts. Or that there was a fact. So, Pardes would be, as I said before, an inclusive, not exclusive concept. And it means multivalent, it's not authorial intent. That means this is the one way of understanding this. This is Ramban's introduction of Chumash. If God wrote Chumash, infinite thought behind it. In fact, I shouldn't even use the word infinite if I'm on my mind at the end, but you know what I mean. Therefore, you can't tell me this is the meaning of any puzzle. There's infinite meanings to each puzzle. But one doesn't knock out the other. Now, the great question about the Rambam was, is the Mornebuchim, the guy for the perplexed, the rationalistic, not the rational, the rationalistic approach that Maimonides displays, for example, in the guide for the perplex, is that simply part of parties? Or was he insisting that the guide is the exclusive truth? He ins- was he insisting on the exclusive truth on the philosophical approach? And that's the big question. And the realm talks and writes to this guy in the guide for perplex, and he said, well, God can't do this, so it means he did that. Is he saying that comprehends the totality of the truth? Or he says it's a mahal, it's a, it's a philosophical mahal. There are other mahals also as well. Right? On the one hand, I'll, I'll show you a perfect example. On the one hand, the Rambam famously and controversially says, in the Guide for the Perplex, that the Carbonus was historically situated. I know you know this. Now, why do all these Carbonus which take up a lot of room, the rules and regulations? Well, People were primitive at that time. <clears throat> Every religion had to have sacrifices, have a temple. If Hashem would say, I'm giving you cold turkey, just have a monotheistic religion. Without any sacrifice, people couldn't understand, couldn't handle it. Therefore, as a, as a sort of concession of what was going on at that time, God said, okay, you have all carbonola, carbonacatas, all different types of sacrifices. The only thing is, do them in a different way than the pagans do. So if they do it in the south, we do it in the north. If they say, um, if the pagans say, yes, honey, and no salt, so we say, yes, salt and no honey, and so forth, things like that. That's an extremely um, historically situated kind of uh, approach. And of course, it implies there are no components once people get smarter. However, look what he says in the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam. There's a whole long riff on this, about the temple sacrifice not being a concession to ancient superstition. This is the Rambam talking in the Hilchus Me'ilo. It's proper for a person to give a lot of thought, misboning, to the laws of the Holy Torah. But lay yourself in Yom Kippur try to figure them out thoroughly, as well as the intellectually can, not superficially. Thoroughly. But Dabra so Shalim so Tom, and if something doesn't somehow make sense to him, but he can't figure out the reason for it. Al ye up, don't treat it lightly. Say, eh, it doesn't make any sense. The Al Yaro Slavos says, Champagne verse, well, don't walk audaciously up the mountain of God lest you be hurt. Meaning, don't blaspheme. Floti Machshav to Abuka Machshav is a different hole. And don't treat it like you would treat a secular subject. If you tell me something that's a secular subject, it makes no sense, I toss it. Bor A. Look. Kam Mechmir Tobilo. The Torah goes nuts about Meila. If you use, if you misappropriate stuff that belongs to the temple, there are big penalties. Umayi makes them a vani offer vafer, and these are inanimate objects. These inanimate objects are property of the temple. Once they're declared property of the temple, they assume kedusha. And anybody misuses them or uses them for mundane purposes. Has violated God's law. I feel like Shogits are kapar, and he needs big kapar even by accident. His old carbon meal. If this is true about things like this, that's for example. Let's pretend long based on me. So I misuse this as I'm doing now. I'd be doing a terrible sin. 
So if that's true, then how much more so to the laws in the Torah if somebody misuses them or treats them with lack of respect? How much more liable to guilt are you? Shall I give it all behab mitnishly day tamon? Don't reject them simply because you don't know the reason. So in other words, if they make no rational sense whatsoever, don't give up on them. And don't assign dumb things to God. Don't treat it as you would treat something secular. Remember the Torah. The Torah says specifically, You should be careful to watch the chukos. You know, the chukos make no sense, right? The chukos. And that is to show you you have to treat the laws which make no in the Torah which have no reason behind them as stringently as the others. Now the Torah says, Ushmartim Vasisam. You should be Shomer and should be Osa. Osa the mitzvah means you perform the mitzvah. That's Hebrew. What does it mean, Shmirah? You should be Shomer in the mitzvah. You guard them, how do you guard a mitzvah? You regard them with, a, with an attitude of intellectual respect. That you don't regard them as something that's less value, less important than the Mishpatin. So in other words, don't say, here are two sets of laws. I'm going to make this up now. There's the laws about a carbon, and there's the laws about thou shalt not kill. Well, thou shalt not kill, that makes sense. So that one I respect. But the law about the carbon doesn't make any respect, so I don't keep it. No, don't smart them. It's a chukos. You have to be careful to guard both. Um, those are the logical misses. The laws which make no sense, you have no right to treat disrespectfully. The Yitzhak even though a person emotions kind of rebel against them because they make no sense. And he might deep down think that they're nonsensical. And the guy might make fun of them. It's your boss of a chazer. Why can't you eat a, a ham? Boss of a cholo, milk and meat, egg la rufa, paraduma, sarmishalea. All the, the scapegoat, all the laws, the thing make no sense. This is Rambam talking. But kamahoy, you double the milk, and start making a milk And the Rambam says that King David, long ago, found himself, he had a big career, in his career, faced with this problem that Minim and Goyim, enemies of the Jews, internal and external, used to go to King David, who of course was a great scholar, and they would taunt him and make fun of him for all the laws that Judaism propounds, which make no sense. The non-rational laws, the illogical laws. And how much did he suffer from their taunting when they made fun of him, and they, when they would hit him with all kinds of arguments, philosophical and otherwise, and he had no answer to them. So by the standards of logic and rationalism, they were right. And what did David do? He frumed down. He frumed down. He didn't come up with better arguments than them. Moses of Kavitarot. He increases the to the throat. Sounds like a Hasidic Rebbe. And this is my monodies. Shenember, Tuffel I Shekhar Zadim. The arrogant ones hit me with all kind of lies that I can't re- answer. Nevertheless, with all my heart, I will follow your laws. Benemr Shem Kolem Mr. Shekhar Dufuni. Bechola Karbonus Kulem Mikla Chukimim. And all the Karbonus fall into this category. And therefore, the Gemara says that the whole world stands on the zechus, on the merit of the karbonos. It's through the correct performance of the sacrifices, people earn olam habo, and so on and so forth. Now, this is the reverse. So, which will the reason, real my mind step forward? On the one hand, you have this passionate speech about the importance of the karbonos, which certainly shows you. That the Rambam, when he wrote the Mishnah Torah, was fully aware of the seemingly non-rational side of, of animal sacrifice and things like that. And then you find the sort of blase business in the God for Plex. Well, at that time, you know, you had to do something because people were primitive. Which is it? Which is the real Rambam? The right-wingers then said, 
Oh, see? That's the real Rambam. When he wrote the Murder of Uchem, he's just doing NCSY. He's trying to appeal to the non from and use language that would win them over. But this is the real truth. Like King David, mostly tough command, he increased the Vegas. The left wingers say, no, wrong. The guide is the real story. The carbonus are baloney, the Rambam didn't believe himself. This is written for the dumbbells. See? Uh, after all, the mission story was written earlier, so what he writes in the guide is more uh, authoritative. And second of all, the mission story was written for the masses, and the guide was written for the intellectuals. Once you have this kind of cross uh, uh, interpretations, there's no dialogue. You see? No dialogue. So as you see, nothing could be definitely ascertained. So each side doubled down, with the result that the left, I'm talking about the hard left now, included many who publicly and privately um, non-observed mitzvahs. They didn't really keep the mitzvahs. They didn't really keep kosher, keep shabbos, and all the rest of it. And this was, as I said before, sort of the first principle of antinomianism ever in modern Judaism. Because remember, let's go to the next one. The four fundamentals, as I always point out, of traditional Judaism in pre-modern times were fundamentalism, nomianism, and the other two. Nomianism means you're committed to keeping the mitzvahs. You get it? I don't say you keep everyone, but you're committed to keeping them all. And here's somebody saying, well, actually, a lot of the nomianism, certainly the things that don't make any sense, don't, you don't have to keep. And so that was really knocking away one of the four legs of the chair holding up Judaism. At the same time, it should be stressed that many others on the hard left continued to observe the mitzvahs, and so it was a complicated reality. And obviously, the Torah monotypes, which I described before, like the Chachim and Liel, were fully observant. They're from Jews. Now, it is a feature throughout history of left-wing culture, down to today, that the extremes keep pushing farther and farther to the left all the time. This is an intrinsic dynamic. You always want to go farther. Once you achieve this, you move next. Once you achieve that, you move farther. Now, the left-wing dynamic expressed itself particularly in southern France and Languedoc with strong consequences. But before we begin that story, let me make a broad observation, a general observation, and let me discuss some happenings elsewhere. So we're in the 13th century. As we shall see in the long run, what put an end to the Maimonidean controversies were the Goyim. That is, different Gentile rulers and governments put a physical end to entire Jewish communities, either through killing, persecution, or expulsion. Now, if there are no Jews left in Languedoc, if there are no Jews left in Spain, for example, there cannot be any controversies there. This did happen in the long run. In the short run, in the 1200s, the expulsions and persecutions did not happen in Languedoc or in Spain, but happened in northern France, in, to in, no in Tosu's land, okay? And in Palestine. Despite the criticisms of the Ramban, the Tosafists never did back down. They still condemned anyone or anything from the Rambo. However, the French Tosafists very soon ceased to exist. The letter of the Ramban was issued in the 1230s. Starting in 1240, shortly afterwards, a series of negative events hit the Jews of northern France, that's Tosos land. Basically, two things came together. Number one, the Christians discovered the Talmud thanks to the Lush and Hara of Nicholas Donin. So they didn't even know the Talmud existed. Therefore, the Jews liked it that way. But a guy who was actually Shiva guy converted to Christianity and told them that. And by the time the story's over, they burned all the Talmuds. They burned all the Gemara. And you know how hard it was to have a book in, in the Middle Ages when it had to be handwritten. In addition, the kings of France ratcheted up the anti-Jewish laws and cruel policies, so deprived of Sfarm, persecuted by the French crown and by the French church, the leading Balitosos, according to tradition, led by Rachel of Paris, departed France for Akko, for Palestine. This is Eretz Yisrael in the 1200s, the middle of the Crusader period. If you'll notice, um, along the coastline, 
It's a kingdom. Same color. Uh, it was a time in the 1100s when the Crusaders controlled all of Israel. But in the 1180s, the Muslims, as you can see, reconquered a lot of it. Most of it. Uh, that's uh, Saladin. But as you can also sort of see, the Christians held on to the coastline from side and in the top to Jaffa on the bottom. And the capital was Akko, Acre. Akko. Okay? Now, um, Akko was a big city, 60,000. It was just huge. And it was a big Jewish community over there. And the Crusaders let them be there. And so the Jews who moved to Eretz Yisrael, by and large, did not move to the Muslim area, but to the Christian one. It's a strange story, but it happened. And most importantly, they set up Lakewood there. And Bikil of Paris was the Russia Shiva of what was called Yeshiva Paris. And so he transported his Yeshiva to Akko, and the name of the Yeshiva was the Paris Yeshiva in Akko. Like you say today, the Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem. It was a time they had what they called the Yeshiva of New Haven in Cleveland. Right? The point of the Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. So the original name is one thing, and the current location is another. So the Yeshiva of Paris, which was a Chashim Yeshiva once upon a time, is now located in Akko. Right? I might point out, this happened in the 1250s. A few years later, Ramban came to Ramban himself, running away from Spain after his debate. Went for a while the Rosh Yeshiva of the Tosafist Yeshiva in um, Akko. I think that's when he wrote his famous um, Rosh Hashanah sermon. So Israel, in a very small place in Akko, was cooking. These Tosafistic types included a number of mystics who wanted to reissue a cherem on the murder of Uchum, like they had nothing better to do. They're lucky to escape France. They're living in the point of a sword in the Crusaders. But they figured that the uh, guy for the perplexed is the cause of all the trouble. There was one guy named Shlomo Petit, which is Shlomo Katan, who Mamish started circulating a cherub for people to sign to burn the Mar Nebuchadnezzar because the grandson of Maimonides happened to move to Akko for a while, for certain reasons, as if the Jews, living in a crusader fortress, continually under the siege by the Muslims because there were constant wars. And by the Mongols, by the way. During this time, it was when the Mongols you know, the Genghis Khan guys invaded Palestine. I repeat, Israel. If that wasn't enough of a problem. Okay? As if that wasn't enough of a problem. They had nothing better to do. This guy, Shlomo Petit, actually sailed from Akko to Europe, to Ashkenaz, which was now in Germany, because Ashkenaz was pretty much destroyed in France, to gather signatures for a new petition, not a petition, a cherub, to burn the murder of the Rambam's grandson, whose name was David, appealed to stop this to the biggest rabbi in Europe, the Rajva, Shlomo ben Adrin in Barcelona, for support. And the Rajva did support him. But it didn't matter to the Germans. Oh boy. Yeah, the backing of the Godel Lajar didn't matter. He wasn't religious for them. He wasn't religious enough for them. Um, in addition... Middle Eastern Jewry in Syria and these places put this guy in Khair Nalu Shlomo Pettit. And so, there are plenty of tempests and teapots. Now, in other words, these new rabbis in the 1250s, I guess, are acting as if the whole incident hadn't happened in the 1230s, as if the Ramban's letter had never been written. The Ramban's points. Uh, brilliantly prescient as they were in warnings of the inutility of such harems, and especially of the ensuing Bizoyan Torah, which could be fatal for Jewish survival in the hostile Middle Ages, were given no consideration by the Shlomo Petit types. An extremely weird episode happened in Italy, because this guy Shlomo Petit visited Italy, the Jewish communities in Italy, on an anti Maranabuchan campaign. Hillel of Verona, we saw him last time, he's got that long story about the burning of the books, he was a doctor in Italy. He was able, he was a pro Rambam guy, he was able to get to the Pope's doctor. Pope's doctor was also from Jew, Maestro Isaac Gayo. The doctor 
got the Pope, Nicholas IV, a Latin copy of the Murder Bukham. The Pope seems to have read it. The Pope said it's kosher. And he ordered a papal proclamation to be read on Shabbos in the synagogues, saying the book was fine, it was actually praiseworthy, and no one ever said anything against it. Oh boy, let me get this straight. The, 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 the religious integrity of the Rambam was upheld in Italy in the 1200s by the Pope of Rome because he read the guy for perplex. You understand that for the right wingers that would be a negative. So, oh, sure, the Rambam was defended by the Pope. So you can't win, okay? I mean, what would the Rambam have said? What happened in the end? Before long, Akko fell to the uh, Muslims and they killed the Jews in the Jewish community. Once again, that was the end of that. No more... Why am I in controversies in Akko? Because everybody's dead. These were small tempests. A bigger storm was brewing in Languedoc in southern France. As I said before, some left-wingers regarded them, who regarded themselves as Hasidim of the Rambam, though they pushed the envelope way beyond the Rambam ever had said or believed, here we encounter the problem that was now to arise in a big way towards the end of the 13th century, Right. Go to the next one. And that's the question of the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. Basically, when you read the Chumash or anything, what's real and what isn't? Better yet, is anything real? The Rambam, who did believe in most of the Bible stories, left no key or methodology how you say this is real or it's not. I mean, the Rambam kind of, it's easy to see that whenever it says God has a finger or a hand or something like that, it's not literal. It's not true. But, did Moshe live? Did he split the Red Sea? Were there ten plagues? Was there lightning and thunder in Sinai? Adam and Eve? You see what I'm saying? He didn't give a clear way how to proceed through the stories. A little bit. As I said before, the Rambam has a sheet of that every time you talk to God or an angel was in the dream. And they say Yaakov therefore didn't wrestle with the angel. It happened in a dream. It's significant because it happened in a prophetic dream. Or Abraham and the three angels and so forth. So there are a few keys here and there. But there are many, many stories that there are no keys to. As a result, it was possible for the open orthodox types to sm assert smugly that this or that story was allegorical, figurative. The Rambam never said it, but they say that's what he meant. Now the tricky part is this. If you say you're... If you say your allegorical interpretation is simply part of Pardes, one of many ways of reading the story, no problem. It is one of the ways of reading the story. Often, if publicly pressed, these open Orthodox guys would say, we're just doing Pardes. But often, that was said with a wink-wink to their fellow cognoscenti. In other words, these frummies came to my show, so I had to tell them I was just kidding. But you and I know it's really true. And the story never happened. In addition, there was a Catholic intellectual tradition in the Middle Ages of something called the Double Truth. Go look it up on Wikipedia. Double Truth theory is the view that religion and philosophy, as separate sources of knowledge, might arrive at contradictory truths without detriment to either. That was really Catholics like skirting the whole problem. Now you start to see Jews saying it. Well, what does that mean? Philosophy tells us that Avram didn't exist. Um, faith tells us Avram did, did exist. So for the news, so what is it? You see, no, it's a double truth. So it's kind of a double speak, right? It's sort of shooting the bull. Some, ling some left wingers sincerely believe in the double truth. There were people like Isaac Albalag and others who wrote his form along these lines. And I would say that they were very left-wing, but they are sincere in believing, because of the 13th century, that, you know, it's possible to believe that Abraham existed, and at the same time, not. Somehow that worked for them. But for others, it was a cynical ploy, as is typical often of the left-wing. At first, a plea for liberality and tolerance for plurality of views. Once that is attained, then there's an insistence on the exclusive legitimacy of the liberal view. In the context of Languedoc, the exclusive truth of radical allegorization is what was asserted. The exclusive truth. 
But what really is happening is that the allegory is of shot. Everything else is not. So basically, Abraham does not exist. Let's put it that way. All the others who don't believe this are Cretans. That's what they say. And they would say, listen, what do you expect from rabbis from tell me this? Well, this was familiar to us today. Now, this was a lingering problem of the 1230s. It was the left wing, not the Tormata, the left wing had doubled down in a fetid atmosphere of ideological resentment that continued to stew in the small communities of Languedoc. For its part, the Torah guys had developed their own left wing within the confines of Torah Mata. There was a famous guy, Shem Tov Falkera. Anyway, these are people for philosophy courses. And he was a very left winger, but on the other hand, does believe in Torah you know. You had all, all types. A very interesting era if you're looking for a, a menagerie. The left wing open orthodox types who now moved farther and farther to the left did not come from the ranks of the Talmudists, but I would say from the secondary intelligentsia, as they call it. In other words, from the masculine. Poets, writers, translators, people who would write science books in Hebrew, that sort of thing. Historically, these masculine envied the privileged status of the Talmudist rabbis to define Judaism. I'm giving a Marxist analysis. Judaism traditional Judaism, has always been run by rabbis. By that I mean they get to define what Judaism is and what the beliefs are. Uh, rabbis have a certain type of education. Now, if you're just a ball of boss and no education is very well, I don't know, leave it up to them. But there always were, there are today, people who are not rabbis who have a Jewish education and just a, a natural power thing is that, well, we should have a say and maybe to us say in defining what Judaism the rabbis don't know. In Languedoc, this phenomenon was, for example, very much represented by the Ibn Tibbon family. He's the guy that translated the Maribuchim, and his father translated other books, and his son translated other books. And indeed, the fights now that I'm about to start talking about would rage right there, as you see in Languedoc, this province which is on the side of Provence in southern France. Look at the map on the right, and you'll see the three cities, I think you can sort of see it. Uh, Montpellier, and then move a little bit uh, northward to, uh, yeah, there's Montpellier, and then keep up the road to Lugnel, and keep up the road to Nimes. These were small but very potent Jewish communities. Look what I have here at the bottom. A guy writes that arrived. This shal is very hard and I have to address it to the three basins. Hayoshim, who were uh, uh, in the holy ground. Echad Yosha Bahar Bayes, Zohar. In Montpellier, that's called the basin. It was in the mountain, the Temple Mount. Hashani Yosha Pesach Azor Luniel. And then you move closer into the, into the area, higher level of Kedusha, and that would be Luniel. Vashlishi Yosha Belishka Zagosis. The third one, which is Nims, which is like the Sanhedrin in the old days, in the heart of the Temple. Shemisham Yosef Terol Chos Vivos of Nims. It's a little bit of exaggeration, but nevertheless, you see that small it is, is, and even though you go there today, it's not much Judaism, in the 1200s, the place was popping. Okay? Now, this is where the fights would rage. The main perpetrators were actually authors who are no longer alive by the time I'm talking about, but his books had attained tremendous popularity with the left-wing sections of the public. I'm talking about the next two books. On the left is Yikov Amayim from Shumal Levin Tibbon, and the right is Malman Atalmim, which is still reprinted once in a while by Yaakov Anatoly. These are names that are forgotten. What are they? In my opinion, the author was not really so bad. They were preachers, and they liked the allegorical stuff. I would say, but within the context of the parties, in my opinion. So it was very fashionable in these circles to allegorize everything in the Parsha week. Okay? It's a certain type of sticky homiletics. But by the 1280s, these works and similar works were taken for and taken for and propounded as the exclusive interpretation of the scriptures by the left wingers. So just instead of being a, a sticky homiletics, Adam and Eve represent the eternal battle of the sexes. No, it's all my dad. 
Hey, is there so long? You know, you could tell. But there wasn't Adam and Eve. No, no, no. You represent the eternal laws. There was no Adam and Eve. See, see what I'm saying? That, that way. So Adam and Eve never actually historically existed. Neither did Noah. Abraham, the patriarchs, the 12 tribes. They're all metaphors. Most of is a metaphor. Basically, allegories went wild. If you read these books, Alvarez and Sarah really are form and matter. Lot and his wife are intellect and matter. Eisner and Rebecca, the actor's soul, intelligent soul. That's Aristotelian soul. Leia is the perceptive soul. Rachel, the intelligent soul. These are a part of the Aristotelian system of the five souls. Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Hudi, Sacher, Zvon, the five senses, right? Smell, taste, feeling, and so forth. Zvon, Kamal, Kedarla, Omer. The imaginative power to retain sense perceptions after the stimuli have ceased. So it wasn't that Kedarla, Omer, and the five kings. The battle of five kings and four kings is just a metaphor, you see? The Garden of Eden is science and philosophy. The Tree of Life is metaphysics. Dean and the functioning sensations seduced by imagination. Done, it's the correct imagination, and on and on and on. So if I, I'll say it again. If you're telling me that this is within parties, all right, you like it, you don't, you know, some like that part, some don't like your part. No, 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 they're saying it's not part. By 1280, they're saying this is really what happened. There is no Abraham. It says no word for a certain type of imagination. You see? That's why I say allegories go mild. I repeat. The left wing was now proclaiming that this is the exclusive meaning. So every Shabbos in Languedoc became a, a tense time. And as soon as they threw the partial of the week, fist fights break out. The geist on the left, generated by these attitudes, was that philosophy must be mastered first before one engages with the Torah and Talmud. Because you're not going to understand anything until you have a very good secular education. This, of course, guaranteed that the study of the Talmud and rabbinic literature would be a Cinderella. You don't get around to that until you finish your PhD, which means you never get around to it. Naturally, it's horrified the right wing. The question is what to do about it. Thoughtful but militant members of the right wing in Languedoc began to think of a response to this mortal threat, and it was a mortal threat. Because they were talking about killing learning. Remember, the left had cloaked itself in the mantle of Maimonideanism. They're saying, what we say is what the Ramadan really tell, which wasn't true, of course, but I'm just saying that's what they said. Again, the right wing I'm talking about is the right wing in Languedoc. In other words, these guys were the successors of Rosh Shalom and Ahar and Rabbi Yenu, who had lived in the 1220s and 30s in Montpellier. The new right wingers in the 1290s were not unaware of the failures and disasters of the 1230s. They did not want to repeat of that. Right? Both sides double down. They end up bringing the Catholic Church in. They burn the books. They cut out people's tongues. They have people murdered. I mean, that, people remember that. However, the right wing was convinced that something had to be done. It could not be ignored. Actually, many from leaders did prefer to ignore, especially if they did not live in Languedoc. It is a uh, natural sign of times, even today. Most people don't like controversies, and they hope maybe it'll just die out. Perhaps they would be right. You can make a good argument that they were right, but I'm talking about what happened. Well, in the event, the person from Languedoc who emerged as the most energetic right winger was named Abamari Hayaki. Hayaki means he's from Luniel. See where it is? Okay? Luniel at the end of the road there. Okay? So he was a Languedoc Jew. He had secular education, but he was mainly Torah educated. In Luniel and Languedoc throughout, he saw everywhere, to his horror, philosophy privileged over Torah, Aristotelianism over traditionalism, allegory over push of shot, dogmatic theology over common sense, and above all, smug skepticism over sincere piety. It drove him crazy and made him furious. He was smart enough to realize that a repeat of the 1230s was a bad idea. First of all, by this time, the Rambam was untouchable. Anything the Rambam wrote was untouchable. I'm talking about for the communities in these areas. To suggest as people that they've always should burn the Rambam's book. Right off the bat, you, you lose. Okay? So there will be no talk in this third Maimonidean controversy of banning the Rambam or anything connected with him. Secondly, appealing to faraway Tosis had been a disaster. Because the Tosifists had been far away physically 
and far away culturally and mentally. Right? You don't appeal to a B'nai Brock to solve a problem you have, you know, in, in New York. But, properly tweaked, Abba Mori Hayachi thought a cherim could be effective. Now this is fascinating, because we saw before a cherim is a unilateral act that seeks to force, coerce, others to do something they don't want to do. How could it be tweaked? The Godol he approached was the Rajba, Solomon ben Adrit of Barcelona. This is close by. Look at the map. There's Luni on one end of the road, Barcelona the other. It's 200 and some miles away. Okay? Now, the Rajba was very different than Tosis. Uh, Solomon ben Adrit was not the Rolf of Barcelona. He was a millionaire, very close of family, who happened to be a super genius in learning. As we know, came one of the greatest Rishonim. He had his own yeshiva, which he paid out of his own pocket. 700 guys. He was a posek of the whole world. He got shells from everywhere, which is why he has thousands of responsa. Thousands. And they're from all corners of the globe. Um, I mean, he just had that charisma. Now, Barcelona is a lot closer, physically and mentally, to Langdahl. As I said before, the Raja was not only the greatest communist, because the Chedushi Rashba, but he was, so knows he was a Kumta Tosus, but he was an international posseg. He dealt with the whole world, whole Kleisra, not just Lakewood. He was no communal rabbi, but independently wealthy. And his yeshiva from all over the world. But it's something different. They approached a guy who had a much broader internationalist perspective, a much greater cosmopolitan Kleisra perspective than the Tosus had had. Right? In addition, he knew that he's the Rosh Kabahag. He was well aware he's Robin Shal Kobani Angola. The Rosh was the greatest person of his time, more or less. I'll take it, just read where the shall is he gets from all over the world. He knew the unique status he enjoyed, and he didn't want to tamper with it or jeopardize it, and for the sake of Shem Shaman, not because he needed it. He was that type. Very interesting person. And, um, he knew what the authority he has that's recognized called or he can make good things happen, he didn't want to jeopardize it. I might add that as a genius and a polyhistor, the Rajma knew Greek philosophy, he knew the Murnabuchan, the other Jewish medieval philosophy books, he knew Kabbalah and mysticism, and obviously he knew Nigla. Okay? He knew everything. On the other hand, he was ideologically a right winger, but as a student of the Ramban, he was the Talmud Muvak of the Ramban. He was aware of the Klal Yisrael reality that not everyone's a right winger. Quite the opposite. As Masil Sisharm says, you can't expect the public to be Hasidim, I mean pious. Correct? You can't expect it. Look, I'm talking right now in the three weeks, in nine days, a few days of Tisha B'Av. There are laws about Tisha B'Av, things you gotta do. There are halakhic leniencies here and there because the public can't put up with this or that. And so you can't impose super stringency in the public. I'm talking about the initial harm. On the other hand, there are customs, for example. Here's one. This is initial harm. There's a custom to fast for three weeks. To fast from Shabbat 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 to Tisha B'Av inclusive, obviously eat at night, like a Ramadan. That's for the casino. They don't tell you you have to do it. You're such a custom. That's your old community. You have people in the right hand who can't wait to fish for three weeks, and other people are looking for a way to eat on Tisha B'av. You see? This is, this is what the Mesil this is what the Rashba means. You can't impose, nobody can study anything secular, nobody can do this on public. It works for the right wing, it doesn't work for everybody. So, he had that perspective. Now, um, so while the Rashba sympathized, was Abba Morhe Yarki of Luniel, and he wanted to ban leftism, especially the leftist curriculum, which inverts first comes Limudi Chol and then Limudi Kodesh. The Raj was very sensitive to imposing unilateralism and provoking blowback and violence. None of that. So I would say the Raj emerges from this whole episode 
as Mr. Public Responsibility. The guy who never says the wrong thing, always appropriate, you know, like that. So the Raja put off the urgings of the hotheads, like Abba Mariachi. Instead, he engaged in extensive consultation with rabbis and communal leaders all over the place to see if a consensus could be formed. Right? He'll issue a statement if we can get everybody on board. This was time-consuming, but that's the nature of Mr. Public Responsibility. No, no unilateral actions. We might have to water it down to get wider support, but we want something that everybody will sign on. As an able political tactician, the Rajma knew that any harem had to be very narrow in effect and affect as few people as possible. Does that make sense? You want a harem to work, can't be something a lot of people violate. The Rajma's goal, therefore, was to win over the Torah Mada to his side, separating them from the left wing. In fact, the Rajma even wanted to peel off part of the left wing, I would say the right and middle of the left wing, if possible, and therefore isolating the extreme left wing, making it easier to stigmatize them. And if we ever come out with any kind of a ban, it'll only be for a few nuts on, on the extreme part. For his part, Baba Moriachi engaged in his own extensive, indefatigable correspondence with rabbis and leaders throughout Languedoc and Spain, seeking their support. I'm talking about hundreds of letters. We know this because he collected these letters and published them in a book called Minchas Knos. Here's my copy. If you get this cool edition of the Tubas of Rajva, it's a nice print. You actually throw in in the back of the Minchas Knos, which is nothing but the Raj, from the Rajva himself. And these are the hundreds of letters, very flowery and very uh, prolix, involving... Um, this whole incident, okay? Where he's trying to say, join us when issuing a harem, the other side, yeah, back and forth, over and under, around and through. So it's a very fascinating book. Now what happens? To tell you the truth, the hour is late. And so I figure, let's finish this after the fast, in our final lecture. And so I bid you, but it's for me, going to be a good Shabbos, and have an easy fast. Good night. So long.